So clearly we need to be more systematic than just uh, expanding these things out and hoping for the best. The whole point is we're getting to places where the very process of the even the initial expansion, which is the which is described by G, is huge. Um, so here's a good way to start that. Um, there's some really nice rules about how G interacts with ordinary ordinal arithmetic, ordinal arithmetic um, although it's a bit tricky. Um, so the claim here is that if we're careful in a certain way that I'll talk about once I uh, look at how the proof works about alpha and beta, then G respects basically addition, multiplication, and um, ordinal exponentiation. So in other words, G sub alpha plus beta of n is just the sum of G alpha of n plus G beta of n. Same for products and same for exponents. Okay, um, And I will talk about what is tricky about this. Um, so, but we're going to use this these rules quite a bit. So um, let me just give a, a short but fairly careful proof of the first statement. I've not been doing much proof here, um, but this is a good example of how a simple induction proof works with ordinals. Okay, so the idea it's it's what you what would be called strong induction um, often in um, a first exposure to a mathematical induction. We're going to assume. Uh, it's going to be induction on beta, and so we're going to assume that we've pro already proved this statement for all alpha. Um, it's not inductive on alpha in this case, and all ordinals gamma that are less than beta. So we're thinking of a particular beta, so think of your favorite ordinal like omega plus 7 or omega squared or something like that. And we're assuming that we've already have it proved for all ordinals that are less than that, and we just want to push it one more. We just want to prove it for beta. Well, there's two very different cases. One is a beta successor ordinal. So we could write beta as, say, beta prime plus 1. So let's see what happens with that. Okay. Um, so I've written it out. We start with the left-hand side of what we want to prove. We want to prove that g of alpha plus beta of n is equal to something. And we recognize that, okay, in this special case, we know that we're assuming that beta is a successor of specifically beta prime, just to have a name for it. Okay. And so we're just rewriting that. Um, now, one really important thing is that I didn't need those parentheses. Uh, ordinal uh, uh, addition is associative. And um, so, in particular, we have an ordinal. We have g of some ordinal plus 1 of n. And that is exactly where one of the rules for g activates. That's always whatever you got for g of alpha plus beta prime of n plus 1. Now, remember, that's what makes it slow growing, is that this is not like repeat the next of the previous value of g and all that kind of stuff. That would be the fast growing hierarchy. OK, so um, now here's where we use the inductive step. We know, we've, we're allowing ourselves to assume that this rule, the sum rule, works for every uh, ordinal up to but not including beta. And beta prime, of course, is one before beta, so we, we're allowed to assume it for that. And so we use the sum rule. And then we just look at the, the second two terms, and we recognize, oh, well, that's exactly what g would give you on beta prime plus 1 evaluated at n. That's the successor rule uh, for g one more time. And then, well, hey, that's just beta. Okay. So this is a classic example, and this is not really different from how an induction proof would work for the integers. You, uh, you, if you know it's true for 13, then you can... Tr prove it for 14 using the fact you know it's for 13, and then you prove it for 15, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, what's different, what, what's unexpected, or you know, what's, what's a new thing if you've never done an induction proof uh, with the ordinals is what happens if beta is a limit? Well, mostly that's, uh, that's straightforward, but there's going to be, this is where the tricky bit comes in, um, which means that you have to be somewhat careful. So, um, here's where we are going to assume, we're going to use uh, a little bit more of the power of this assume assumption that we've proved it for all ordinals, say gamma, just have a name for them, less than beta. Okay, so let's see what happens. Beta is a limit ordinal. I start with the left-hand side of what I want to prove, pretty standard way to start, start a proof of inequality, and I use the rule. Now, um, if beta is a limit ordinal, alpha plus beta is going to be a limit ordinal, and so I'm going to apply uh, the limit rule to alpha plus beta, and then here's the very tricky thing. Um, we'd like to be able to say, just kind of like we said with the, with the successor, is that alpha just hangs out and goes along for the ride, and that the nth term in the fundamental sequence for alpha plus beta is going to be uh, the alpha left alone plus the nth term of the fundamental sequence for beta. 
if that's true, we can push the induction one more step further. And I'll come back to that being the tricky bit. But let's assume that's true for a second. OK. Um, then um, the good thing is beta of n, the beta brackets n, is the nth term in the fundamental sequence for beta, which by definition is less than beta. It's one of the things that sneaks up to beta. And we are assuming that we've already proved this statement for those, those, um, those values. That's one of those gamma values that's less than beta. So we can now use the, the inductive hypothesis, use the rule for a, a smaller um, ordinal. And then voila, we've just exactly written down what would happen if we took j of beta on its own and used the limit rule for g. And we're done. OK. So what could go wrong here? What's exactly, what's an example of this second equality failing? Well, 1 plus omega, doesn't take, it doesn't take long to look for one, if, you're, if you know to look for one, to find one. If you have 1 plus omega, for example, okay, if alpha is 1 and beta is omega, g of 1 plus omega of n, okay, by definition is g of 1 plus omega brackets n of n, okay, but here's the thing, 1 plus omega is just omega. That's one of those weird things about ordinal arithmetic. If you put the 1 on the left, it does not change omega at all. And so that's just g of omega brackets n of n, which the point is that that's very different from g of 1 plus omega brackets n. The 1 did not just come along for the ride. It got absorbed into the omega because it's in a place that you really aren't really supposed to write that 1. It's a very non-standard place. Okay, so if you actually look to calculate what the calculation gives you exactly, it just gives you g of n of n. Now, as it happens, that this n now doesn't matter at all because um, g of n is a constant function. In any case, you get n. Okay, so is that what the what we wanted on the right hand side? Absolutely not. The rule was gonna say you can split up the alpha and the beta completely separately, and do g of one of n, which is just one, plus g omega of n, which is n. That would give you n plus one plus n, and that's of course not equal to n. And the real thing was this inequality here is that when we took the fundamental sequence, um, the one had already evaporated, and it's definitely not the same as the one left alone plus the fundamental sequence for the second part, what we were calling beta. Okay, so here's the deal. Okay, careful means that um, at every step of the inductive proof, this is an unfortunate thing, it's not just for you have to check something for the beta that you're interested in right at the moment. At every step, step of the induction, let's say, we need um, alpha plus beta, the nth term of the fundamental sequence for that, to be alpha left alone plus beta fundamental sequence. Okay, And you can do that. Uh, you can be systematically careful by keeping things in a normal form. Basically, never writing things as like 1 plus omega. Basically, uh, smaller plus bigger with the smaller on the left is the bad thing, okay? And there's, va there's various instructions for how to write things in normal forms to avoid this, kinds of, this kind of problem. Um, and so we'll need to watch out for that. Um, it turns out that it doesn't kill us, uh, that the way we're, the expressions we're gonna be led to write down when we look at ordinal collapsing functions, things like that, um, are exactly going to be things that are in a normal form, and we have cons we'll have consistent rules for keeping things in a normal form, and so this won't screw us up. Um, but I did want to advertise that it, you don't want to just assume it's really it is really dangerous and wrong to just say for every possible alpha and beta these rules are true. It's it's not that simple, but it's pretty. What I'm going to show you is going to be pretty much as if it is, and I'm not going to make a whole lot of uh, stink about being super super careful about that. Okay, um, so for example, um, I'm going to chop this off pretty soon. But what about our our cool trick of like g omega to the omega of n? The claim was that was just uh, put in n for both the omegas, and you just get n, ooh, I don't know why that's, okay, was n to the n. Why is that true? Okay, well, it's going to be true because, um, let's see, I'll use the subscripts because they're pretty small. That's g sub omega of n to the g sub omega of n using that third rule. I didn't prove that one, but it's, this proof is very, very similar for both multiplication and exponentiation to the proof I showed you for addition. 
Okay, and you do have to be careful that um, this is really not one of those cases where it gets weird and, and this is not in a normal form, but this is absolutely in a normal form. This is in what's called Cantor normal form. And we know what g omega of n is. It's n, and that's n as well. And that's my timer saying I need to stop pretty soon here. Okay, um, so indeed, we get what we want. And more generally, um, our cool trick said that whenever you have some arithmetic expression um, with omegas and finite numbers, that you just plug in uh, the, the number n. Well, that really follows from these three rules. Let me go back up. Okay, that really follows from these three rules. Any arithmetic expression in terms of omegas and finite numbers is going to be built out of these three uh, these three operations. And this says you can take it apart into its all its component pieces. And then whenever you see a finite number, of course, g finite of n is just that finite number. And whenever you see omega, g omega of n is just n. And it's easy to prove from that our rule that uh, when you look at any normal form expression involving omegas and finite numbers, you just plug in n wherever you see an omega. Okay, um, so we'll see how that goes further, and that's going to be a really nice tool, and it's going to be a model for some other tools for how we can kind of keep up every time we go further in the ordinals, especially once we really get into the meat of the ordinal collapsing function, how we can keep up and get a sense of what the g is um, as we go. And we won't forget f, but we'll do a, a sort of lighter touch on f in terms of just kind of getting to where our mind is boggled and then going back to g for each of the ordinals we'll analyze.